And we'll move to the NDP caucus, the Honourable Dave Wilson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for, for being here. And there's definitely a lot of interest uh, in, in the province on this project. Uh, I think there's been a commitment from all three uh, parties uh, who have been in government that the need is there to, to do this project. And uh, Nova Scotians are, are just waiting to see uh, when that will happen. So I know we've, t we've heard some questions around financing and costs. Uh, what is the expected uh, date uh, that you have on the project that things would be finalized. People will be moved out of those two facilities. Uh, uh, procedures, uh, services will be given uh, in other locations. W do you have a date in mind? Mr. O'Connor. Okay, I'll, I'll try to address that. So, it's, it's similar to the um, costing uh, answer that I gave earlier. So part of uh, the work as we're doing the planning is to look at time and scheduling. So if we do it this way, if we do it that way, if we build the building sort of here, could you build them together the same time, these two buildings that may have to be added to that site, or would one have to be done be ahead of the other? So all that drives time. So as we're working through this, we're doing timelines uh, on a regular basis, and then we're looking at from beyond, um, so that's about like how long would it take uh, during construction or during design. So we, a lot of that's being mapped out, and we have, uh, the same process we followed for all other projects. Um, we provided timelines for Dartmouth General, we provided timelines which we already completed for Hans, so on. So no different for, for this work. It'll take the same approach. At this point in time, uh, we have estimated some timelines on the website in May or April of uh, 2016. We are targeting 22 or beyond, 2022 or beyond, to be finished to the point where services uh, could be completely emptied out of the uh, Victorian Centennial Building, but there will be some services, as uh, Paula Bond had mentioned earlier, uh, uh, that will be uh, taking, uh, moved out of those uh, buildings as other things come online. So Dartmouth General, for example, we're targeting uh, the expansion project to be, the addition to be ready around uh, 2020, and then the rest of the work at Dartmouth be late 21 into early 22. So as all those things come online, as Hans just came online, all of that is part of the overall schedule of de, and, and I guess we use this word decanning, which nobody likes, but that's the one that seems to have, have been used a lot with, with the emptying out of the uh, uh, Victorian Centennial okay. buildings. And I mean, the biggest component to this uh, from our, our, our point of view or our position is, is what, what options and how are you proceeding forward with the remainder of the bills. The, you know, you've mentioned P3 options, uh, it's no secret. We've uh, advocated uh, for a number of years now that that shouldn't be uh, the avenue the province goes down. But that's gonna determine, uh, I think, the timeline. So when would you, uh, when would you expect a decision from the government uh, on the financing is going to come from Treasury Board, or the financing is going to come from some P3 model. Are, are you, do you expect a more clear of a, a path forward come uh, in, a, in a month's time or a couple of weeks' time when the budget's uh, uh, unveiled here in Nova Scotia? So um, we haven't been able to provide the government with all the information yet, so the work that Deloitte is doing is going to uh, schedule to be completed in around the end of April, okay. in the early part of May then we have to gain review of that work and make sure it's in keeping with what we've uh, contracted them to do. Okay. And um, then that's part of the, uh, the decision making. That information will be that together with the what, which is the programming and the work from Kazian, will then uh, help um, inform the government to make a decision. So with that information being handed to government and the decision makers, is that, are you looking at design, build, are you looking at design, build, finance, are you looking at design, build, finance, and operate? Are all those options still on the table? Yeah, you, or at this point in time. Okay, we'll hear from Mr. Porter, if that's yeah. all right. Uh, good morning, thank you for the question. Um, I think if you're, you're seeing a theme here, one is uh, process is important. Um, we, uh, uh, we contracted with Deloitte uh, uh, in 2017 to really help advise us on how to arrive at a decision on whether we go to a design, build, finance, maintain, or a traditional <coughs> method of delivery. Uh, some of the work that, that went into that is really critically important. First of all, we've asked them to examine uh, projects and findings uh, of hospital P3s elsewhere in Canada. In doing so, we want them to 
to really place a lot of emphasis on, uh, on Auditor General findings, uh, process-related uh, uh, deficiencies, if you will, what worked really well what, uh, and, and what could be, uh, could be improved, or what, uh, uh, you know, what have they found in, in those jurisdictions. That was an extensive piece of work. Uh, from that, that helps us design a business case process that will, that will really get at uh, whether or not it's in the best interest of Nova Scotia to move forward with an alternative procurement. Okay. The range includes a traditional design bid build, uh, which is usually the government approach, uh, up through to a design build finance and maintain and pretty much everything in between. And we'll examine those options, okay. narrow it down to, uh, right. to a few. Thank you for that. And, and I know uh, Mr. LaFleche uh, indicated uh, that the, the group is trying to avoid passive mistakes and, uh, and uh, there has been uh, you know, projects in other jurisdictions that have gone severely off the rails when it comes to P3 hospital rebuilds and redevelopments. And the former uh, Deputy Minister of Health in, in uh, a briefing to the Minister a couple of years ago indicated that and I would hope that the current Deputy uh, might hold that, uh, that opinion also. Uh, just quickly and I'm going to hand off to, uh, to my colleague. Um, you talked about the Hans Community Hospital and doubling the procedure capacity there. Um, I don't know if you're aware of, uh, uh, of what's happening currently in our system around patient transfer and EMS in the province, but there are communities today that are, are not being covered uh, because of the delays of transferring care over. When I hear about this, I know paramedics in the province are going to say, here, we're going to increase uh, the number of transfers to Hans now. Has there been any talk on enhancing EHS, uh, increasing transfer capacity so that emergency ambulances are not being used to transfer people from Halifax to Windsor, creating even worse uh, scenario down the road uh, once the doubling of procedures happen there? Ms. Bond? Thank you. And yes, we're, we're aware that we're working very closely with EHS uh, on all of the transfer issues that we are facing today and, and the emergency department uh, services. Um, but hence, the increase in hence, uh, ORs uh, is an increase in day surgeries. These are not patients that will be transferred from the Halifax Infirmary or from Dartmouth General or other areas. These are patients that would have normally, in a lot of cases, have to have come into Halifax to have their surgeries done because they did not have the capacity in hands. Um, now we're thrilled, uh, as are um, the physicians and, and the community of hands, uh, that we will be able to offer double the surgeries, uh, outpatient surgeries that are omitting having to have the, not only travel into uh, Halifax, downtown Halifax, and, and all the complications that go with that. So uh, in working with EHS and with our uh, Department of Health and Wellness colleagues, uh, we do not anticipate that particular situation to have an impact on the okay. transfer services. And, and I wish we had a lot more time because I'd love to dive into more of the, what the current situation is. But I will pass uh, my time off to my colleague here. Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, is there utilization data available on the existing infrastructure that we're, we are, uh, all of this project is aimed at, at replacing? Ms. Bond. Thank you. Sir, can you clarify the question for me? I was thinking more of the infrastructure and looking at Mr. O'Connor. I'm looking at the, the space that is available now uh, for all the different procedures, all the different work that happens within the QE2 complex. And is it fully utilized and, and for what portion of the week of the hours of potential operation is it actually fully utilized? Well, we always look at efficiencies and where we can be more efficient in, this, in the system. Unfortunately, with the VG infrastructure, that's not always possible. We have continual uh, pressures there at the VG. I do want to make uh, a comment, though, that we are, we are very proud of the quality of service that's delivered at the VG. Uh, but certainly uh, utilization of operating rooms, of beds. We, are, we all know that we have bed pressures within the QE2. Uh, we look at a day, it's a daily assessment of who are in those beds, uh, what are the priorities for patients in beds and, and the ORs as well as the emergency services. Um, so we, we constantly are reviewing that. I guess I, I'm thinking more forward looking. Uh, you know, we, we know that we're at the early stage of the baby boomer population aging into a, a phase of life where they, they need 
uh, you know, more medical care in Nova Scotia. We are looking to replace spaces that are, yes, currently not as functional as they could and should be, but how are we adjusting what we're building to anticipate efficient spaces that are also used efficiently through centralized scheduling, through maximizing um, how people work together so that we're not building more space just because maybe two different teams don't, you know, don't agree on when the OR should be given to them, for example. And I'm seeing some nods over there, so I, I don't think I'm completely off my rocker. Thank you for the clarification and an excellent question. Uh, we are absolutely looking at uh, population growth and, and the aging population of Nova Scotians. Look at where services are delivered today and where they're best delivered. In one of the opening statements that both Ms. Knox and, and uh, Deputy Minister LaFleche made is that this cannot be about replacing the bricks and mortars of the VG. Uh, it is about where we can best uh, plan provincially, implement uh, locally. It's about distribution of services. It's about what's happening. It's going to be happening over the next 30 or 50 years. We all know that services, uh, the way the services were delivered, my background is nursing, um, the way the services were delivered in hospitals uh, 20 years ago are totally different than the way that we deliver services today. We know that we're doing a lot of less invasive surgeries, so the operating theaters will look differently, uh, as well as who's going to be in those different procedures and the teams that are going to be there. You're absolutely right. This is more about a collaborative model that we're looking into. It's why we are very intent on having uh, the proper planning in order to get this right. Uh, over the many, many years of healthcare services in this province across the country, it's been one of the issues and it's one of the reasons why the we are ensuring that clinical, both physicians, nurses and other staff are involved in this planning to help us try. It's not going to be perfect by any stretch, but certainly to try to look at how, how can we bring teams together to prevent um, patients and families from having to come in, uh, excuse me, having to come in four times for a visit when it properly coordinated and we had some centralized booking that they could come in for one, one service. Uh, uh, patients uh, today rarely come in for one clinic check uh, in, the, in the RAM. So if you have with the comorbidities that we're dealing with with our aging population, uh, you're absolutely correct. We have patients that are coming in to see a vascular surgeon one day, a cardiologist the next day, and, and, and possibly having blood work the next day. Part of this planning is a coordination of these services, where they can be delivered, and how best to meet the needs of the population of Nova Scotians. And so um, earlier my colleague was asking about, um, a, about a plan. Can we see how consultation with patients and families, can we, can we see a, a robust feedback plan from patients and families on their current experiences? Is there, is there a re report on that patient input and is there a finalized care plan that looks forward to like when when this HI site will actually be built so that we can we can see that the best choices, the most rational and, and, and efficient choices are being made for building the hospital that we need in the future. Respond. Thank you. I think there were a couple of questions there. So Sorry, two, I, I'm looking for two plans. I'm looking for is there is there a document that shows how patients and families helped to shape uh, the care plan and is there a finalized care plan in terms of what services we actually need delivered when and by whom and where? Yes, we actually have a patient family advisory committee uh, that was, uh, there was an advertisement, a public advertisement for that committee that has been in place. Uh, we, are, we are very fortunate that we have very uh, dedicated patients and families that have been part of our planning and wayfinding and giving us input into how important it is uh, for not only for distribution of services, but the coordination of services. And we can certainly provide that for you. Uh, we do have other uh, websites uh, that uh, patients and families and staff and communities can go on and offer also uh, opinions and suggestions about what would be important uh, for this project and in well into the future. So we can provide you with that. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure in which opening uh, remark I heard that there were 950 inpatients at the QE2 complex right now. Um, what number of those on a given day would, um, would be alternate level of care patients? Ms. Bond. 
Thank you. I don't have the numbers for today. It does fluctuate. Uh, we certainly have uh, anywhere we can have in the, throughout the QE2, we can have up to uh, 60 to 65 uh, patients that are alternate level of care patients. Uh, they would include patients that have been identified as alternate level of care patients and those patients also uh, that are waiting for assessment as to what level of care they need. That could be going to a long-term care facility, it could be going home, and so working with families and the patient themselves to identify uh, the appropriate needs for the patient to be discharged from acute care. Uh, you know, we. We understand that those are some pressures that we do see within the acute care systems across the province, uh, and we are working with our uh, Department of Health and Wellness, our community partners, uh, to address those and, and to get teams um, in place to move patients to the appropriate um, care place with the right care provider, uh, which is one of the principles of how we're developing the QE2 redevelopment, and that is providing care in the right place at the right time with the right care provider. And, uh, and we certainly all know that that is not um, uh, the priority would be in an acute care setting. Uh, our intention is to have, pa have uh, patients uh, treated in acute care settings or in in-hospital settings when they need it and not when they don't. And so uh, I referred back to the Auditor General's report from June of 2016 and, and he presented the figure that it costs $250 a day for a long-term care bed versus $1,300 a day for a hospital bed. As part of this QB2 project, and again, looking at where we're heading with our demographics, was there any consideration uh, of investing in more long-term care beds in part to reduce the demand on, on uh, this, the acute care hospital setting? Mr. LaFleche. So uh, there's also the question of a ho hospices in there, and uh, maybe at this point it's best to let Ms. Perrette ad address some of these questions. but. Uh, because not everything you referred to is part of why we're here today, which is the QE2. Mm -hmm. Some of it is part of the broader health system. And, uh, uh, but first I would like, John, just to talk about the, uh, you touched on utilization. And I think it's important to understand the difference in approach we took when we, uh, we, we started this project was not just to do a new build downtown, but rather to look broader at utilization, okay. what you're talking about, and John can address that. Uh, okay that issue with respect so, to. So can I, can I yeah. hear about, was there, was there a rationale for why we aren't building more long-term care bids, builds long-term care beds in order to reduce the demand on the acute care hospital? Do you want to go first? Okay, Denise will answer that. Ms. Perrette. Thank you for the question, it's an important question and it illustrates some of the moving parts in the system. So the short answer is yes, we're paying attention to that. Um, as Deputy Dill Flush said, that's not a key component of the QE2 redevelopment, but just as you see a horizontal team-based approach here on QE2 redevelopment, you would see that on continuing care. So in both cases, we look at population uh, data, the demographic data, the trend analysis as to aging populations, uh, the incidence of chronic diseases, and, and those plans are underway to address that. So they're on different tracks, but they're absolutely happening. Thank you. Okay, again, going back to the June 2016 Auditor General's report, there was reference there to another uh, innovation outside of the hospital that reduced demand on the hospital, which was the Care by Design um, program, which uh, introduced rounds at long-term care and at long-term care facilities and greatly reduced transfers to hospital. Of, of, of residents of those long-term care beds. And the Department of Health decided to, you know, s switch away, not, not pursue that program. And I'm wondering if there's a, a, a rationale for that or if there might be a return to that. So I would say in general, because I don't know the specifics of that program, is that absolutely looking at how we move patients first out of hospitals quickly so that their time in hospital is minimal because that's important to do. We want to move them home first, if possible, but we need to support caregivers in doing that. So we don't want to do that rashly. And absolutely in long-term care, we want to look at continuous improvement and how the quality of, of care in those institutions is maintained and improved. So all of that is, is underway in our continuing care planning, uh, as I said, simultaneous to this type of work. Thank you. Thank you. Time has expired.